Good morning, Los Alamitos. Okay, so uh, some questions from the AP class about uh, some of the lab-related problems that I left for you. Or actually, one is about the lab-related problems. The other is about uh, the number two question on the 2019 uh, AP exam. So I'm going to try to address both of those. Now, um, when we were doing our class session, uh, I kind of tried to solve this uh, uh, 1999 Part D uh, problem uh, using uh, the work energy theorem. But let's just remind you that we have some sort of uh, a dart that has a mass of m and a velocity v naught, and it's moving towards a big heavy block, and it's going to embed itself. And in the previous parts of the problem, it embeds itself, and then this this block moves together. But in this part of the problem, they want to zoom in on how far this block. Uh, I'm sorry, this dart actually penetrates into the block. So the nose of the dart is going to go a certain distance in, and that distance is going to be a distance L. And that distance is governed by the fact that the force on the dart is equal to minus BV. Now this rings some bells because we did this before. We did this when we did drag, when we did the person jumping out of an airplane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the way that we set this up before, and I'm going to go ahead and go through it, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what I did wrong in class and where that should have pushed me to go. But let's do it the um, incredibly obnoxious uh, way. Um, when we did the drag problem, we uh, didn't use the work energy theorem. We simply said we know the force on this thing, and forces are all equal to masses times acceleration. So that's where we started from. Now this is going to be a dual process because our eventual goal is to find L, the distance that this dart penetrates into the block. Um, so I'm going to start over here, and we're going to go with minus BV equals MA. This is Newton's second law. We're going to move the M to the other side. And we're going to write A as the first derivative of V. This is what turns it into a differential equation. This differential equation is best solved because it's a first order differential equation. It's best solved by separation of variables. That is, get all the V related things together onto one side and all the T related things on to the other side. This is a constant. It's neither V nor T related, but let's stick it with T because it's easier to handle on this side. So I've moved the DT to this side and I've moved DV I'm sorry, V underneath the DV on that side. And now your best bet is to integrate both sides. So let's take our constant out front. We're going to have an integral of nothing dt, a very simple integral. It yields uh, t and your, um, your limits. And this one is going to be the integral of dV over V, or the integral of 1 over V. Now the integral of 1 over the variable uh, happens to be natural log of the variable and this is minus b over m and integral of g dt. Now let's talk about our limits. The time goes from zero to some other time in the middle of the problem. This is a non-specific time in the middle of the problem. I'm sorry, this one right here is a non-specific time in the middle of the problem. This is my um, uh, definite, no, indefinite definite integral. And we start at a velocity of v naught and we slow down to some intermediate velocity of v. Yes, we want this v to eventually be zero perhaps, uh, and this t maybe to go to infinity perhaps, but uh, this is just some intermediate time in the middle of the problem, and these are our starting variables right here. Now this one's really easy. This side turns into minus b over m times t. And now this side, we need to pull a little trick. You see, we're going to have natural log V minus natural log V naught. But the difference of two natural logs is the natural log of their ratio. Now, everything's fine and dandy hunky-dory, uh, except that we've got a natural log. What an obnoxious function that is. What is the antidote? How can I get rid of natural log? And the opposite of natural log is e to the something. So let's apply e to both sides. e to the minus B over M times T and e to the natural log of this quotient here. Now e and natural log cancel each other out, so e to the minus b over m times t is simply going to be v over v naught, leading us to our final function that velocity as a function of t, not multiplied by, but as a function of t, is v naught times e to the minus b over m times t. We got this result when we were doing this in class. It makes sense because it's a d declining or decreasing exponential, decaying exponential, maybe the best way to say that. Um, and it starts at the known value of V naught. So at the moment of impact, we're going V naught, and then we decline from there. So that's wonderful, but that doesn't get us our length unless we 
let's change to another color here. Unless we utilize another little fact, and that is that we have a function of v, which happens to be dx dt. Oh, is this starting to smell like something we might have done before? Yeah, so this we can also uh, uh, move the, the, the d's and separate variables, so to speak, because velocity is a function of time. So we're going to get that dx is equal to v dt, and we're going to integrate both sides here as well. Integrating nothing dx gives you x, and that will be evaluated at its endpoints. Uh, x, the distance penetrated, goes from 0 to L, we hope. And over here, um, we're going to integrate with respect to t, and we're going to integrate our function v, which is, uh, we're going to be integrating v naught e to the minus b over m times t dt. Okay, not the, oh, and uh, what are our limits of integration? Well, zero to infinity, right? We're going to let the time range to infinity to get rid of this thing. Okay, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that happens here. Um, we are uh, pulling out a constant, and we are integrating e to the minus b over mt, which gives us back e to the minus b over m times t, but it gives us a minus m over b, if I'm not mistaken, out front and then e to the minus b over m times t, and that will need to be evaluated between zero and infinity. Okay, so on this side, we're just gonna get L equals, and on this side, we're gonna have a m v naught over b. There's a minus sign floating around here, but the thing is, when we put minus infinity in here, we get zero, and so with zero minus uh, e to the zero, which is one. Zero minus one is minus one, but then it cancels that spine sign, so there's just a factor of one from our limits of integration. And that means that the length that this thing will penetrate into the block is this. Now that is probably the official way to solve this problem. We have a differential equation. We have some math magic calculus uh, that we use to um, uh, establish the relationship between a velocity that's changing in time and the position that's changing in time. And we put in a time of infinity. We let this go as long as it's going to go, and we get this answer. This is only worth two points, and that's a lot of work for just two points. I believe this is the last part of the problem as well. So this is something that you may decide to jettison in favor of another problem because of time. But if you have the time to do this, this is probably the way they wanted you to do it. Now let me show you what I did and what you could do. I had the brilliant idea because we're looking for a distance to use the work energy theorem, saying that the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Now the work done is the integral of the force over the distance, and the change in kinetic energy is just the entire kinetic energy that this dart has when it starts off. And I thought this is very exciting because somewhere inside of this integral, we're going to get L out of it. So I put in my force here, integral minus V, V, DX, and then this is just a number MV naught squared over 2. And then I said, well, V here, um, we can get the, the B to the other side if we want to, but, but V here is a function of X. In other words, this is D x dt, and then we're dxing it again, and oh my god, um, this could get really nasty really fast. Uh, m v naught squared to b. Um, I, I don't know what to do with this. I was hoping that something would cancel here, and that should tell me that uh, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing, that, it, that this is not really going to work out directly. But strangely enough, when energy doesn't work, Momentum sometimes does, and the brother to the work energy theorem is the impulse momentum theorem, saying that the change in momentum is equal to the integral of the force with respect to time. Now, this might seem like a strange thing to do because we're looking for a distance, not a time, but we've seen that when we put in velocity as its definition of dx dt, that we get some sort of change of variables, and that's going to cancel out the dt's when we do this. This is going to be freaking brilliant. So the amount of momentum that we're losing is the entire momentum of the dart at the beginning of the problem. And then our integral is minus bv dt. We'll take the b to the other side. We'll get the minus sign to the other side. And now we have the integral of dx dt. That's what v is, dt. And suddenly the dt's cancel, and we're left with an integral of dx over appropriate limits. Well, appropriate limits, 0 to L. Hey, how about it? So um, 
The only thing that's screwed up here is I got a minus sign popping out that I didn't really want. I've got minus m v naught over b equaling x uh, evaluated between l and zero, which is just l. So somehow by doing this, I got a minus sign, and that's the curse of my life. I got minus signs popping out all over the place. That doesn't make any sense that it would be a minus sign, um, but. Uh, Apart from that, I very rapidly got the correct answer without all the intermediate finding of an incredible function for velocity and then turning that incredible function for velocity into a distance by letting time go to infinity. This was a lot more reasonable. There is a lot of physics here somehow. And I also, although this is where I think I should have worked in order to find a distance, remember that uh, energy cares about distance, not space, not time, and momentum cares about time, not space. But because of this definition of velocity being dx dt, we kind of pulled an Aikido move, a judo move, and flipped it over, and um, we got the answer. So uh, put that in your pipe and smoke it, and remember that this is... Uh, worth two points and it's not worth chasing down. It is also so different than the entire previous part of the problem as to be comical. Okay, I'm going to have to pause for a second because I need to get a fresh sheet of paper. Okay, we're going to retask the last crosswords from the last couple of days in the New York Times and we're going to talk about um, the number two question on the 2019 free response number two. And uh, I'm going to have to bring this up on my screen. This is going to be a little weird. Let's see if I can get this going here. There it is. So um, what we wind up with here is we have a table. And the table has a height of 2L. On the table is a block, block number 2. And block number 2 has a mass of M, capital M. Block number 1 is actually suspended from a string of length L, and block number one has a mass of 3m. And block number one is going to swing down, hit block number two, and project block number two onto the floor where it lands a distance 4l away from um, the, uh, the edge of the table. Okay, so, um, and then afterwards, uh, block one is going to swing up to um, an angle of theta max, which is how far it's going to swing up. So the um, first thing uh, we need to figure out is what is the speed of block one at the bottom of its swing just before it hits block two? And that's part A, and that's going to be fairly easy. I would use energy, the MGH, the potential energy that this block number one has by being up here, turns into kinetic energy one has mv squared. does not matter that the actual mass is 3m because mass cancels out, so V is going to be the square root of 2GH. However, the height that this thing is up is actually L, so square root of 2GL should be the correct answer. This is something we've done a lot. Um, this is only worth one point for some reason. Um, kind of sad, uh, but maybe just because it's something we've done a lot. Okay, on the, uh, on the dot below, please draw and label the forces, not the components, uh, that act on block number one just before it makes contact with block number two. Okay, so block number one, as it's about to make contact right here, um, is going to be in the midst of swinging, which means there's going to be some tension force and there's going to be some weight. And I have drawn the tension force being larger than the weight. Um, and so there are two points for this, and one is for the correct forces, and one is for showing that tension force is larger than the weight. Do you know why? The tension force must be larger than the weight at that spot. Yes, you do. Very good. Okay, so we are moving on. Uh, part C says, derive an expression for the tension of the string when the string is vertical, vertical, just before block one makes contact with block two. If you need to draw anything other than what you've drawn, okay, so we're going to do the math associated with this now. And this is going to be part C. The math associated this with this, excuse me, says that the tension minus the weight of the block is going to equal the centripetal force mv squared over r. Okay, in this case, we do need to put the um, m in as what it is. So let's put in what these things really are. Um, I'm also going to move the minus mg to the other side. So tension is going to be equal to the quantity 3m times g plus... Um, 
v squared, and this is the velocity, so we got 2 gl over l. Well, okay, um, the r is l, and the other l comes from this v squared here, so um, looks like the l's cancel, and what we're going to talk about here is g plus 2g, or 3g, so 3m times 3g is going to be a total of 9mg is the tension in the string at that moment. Uh, let me double check here. I need to make sure that my paper is not, yeah, there we go. I'm looking at uh, the, the question, not the, not the paper. Okay, here we go. All right, so far so good. Um, uh, this was also worth two points. And we're on to part D. For part D, calculate the time between the instant block two leaves the table and the instant it first contacts the floor. All right, that is something we can do very easily because the time it's gonna to take to fall down the distance 2L is independent of its horizontal projection off the table as a result of the collision. So all we have to do is figure out how long it's gonna to take to fall and let's use the Swiss Army equation. The distance fallen is going to be one half uh, AT squared. If there's no initial velocity in the vertical direction, this is the Swiss Army equation. So the distance is 2L and that's gonna equal one half of G times the time squared. Moving things to the other side, the two goes over there, multiplies, becomes four. The G goes to the other side, and we have T equals square root of 4L over G. Um, if you want to, you could say two times the quantity square root L over G is the time to hit the ground. Um, we have, I think we have numbers for this, um, because they said, uh, let L be 0.75 meters. Um, so I guess we could put in for this. Uh, I don't have my calculator handy, folks. I'm sorry. Uh, so you're going to be responsible for finding a numerical answer for this. But we're moving on to part E. Calculate the speed of block two as it leaves the table. Now, you might be inclined to worry about the collision, but we do not know whether this is an elastic or inelastic collision. No, they don't stick together, so it's not perfectly um inelastic, but we aren't sure how much um, momentum is transferred to the block or how much energy or what. So um, this is best figured out by saying, well, now we know we in this amount of time, we go this amount of distance. So let's figure that out. Using the Swiss Army equation in the x direction. Oh, I should have used y's up here. Oh my. Okay. Well, um, you know, note to self for next time, use y's for part D and x's for but the concept is that velocity in the x direction times t, and we're trying to find the velocity in the x direction, am I correct? Yes, so um, that means that the distance gone, 4L, is equal to the velocity in the x direction times this t, which is two times the square root of L over G, and so that means that Vx is gonna equal 4L over two times the square root of L over G. Oh God, that is, um, Disgusting in the extreme. Let's see if that uh, this comes in as an L squared. So 4 over 2 is 2. We're going to have a square root of G. And on the bottom here, we're going to have um, G. Oh, it's G times L. Huh. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, that that, that uh, little uh, vinculum there is uh, no bueno. Let's see. 2 times the square root of G L. And you can put um, stuff in for that. And you can get your numerical answer for that one as well. I think we're done here. No, there is a part F and a G. Oh, my God. Okay, so uh, we're going to calculate the speed of block one after it collides with block two. Okay, so um, I'm going to need to get these numbers, folks. I'm sorry. Uh, again, I don't have my calculator handy, but let's just go ahead and, and, and cheat and look at this thing. This number is going to be 0.55 seconds, and this number is going to be 5.45 meters per second. Good. I'm going to need those numbers uh, when I do this next little bit here. Okay. So now we're going to find the um, the speed of block one after the collision. So remember, block one comes in, hits block two, and then block one continues on and block two continues on. We want to find this speed, the speed of block one. We now know the speed of block two, and we knew the initial speed, which was the incoming speed, um, uh, which, by the way, was uh, root 2 GL. So let's just go ahead and crank this out. 
Um, so uh, the total momentum beforehand equals the momentum of one plus the momentum of two. The total momentum beforehand is just an object of mass three m traveling at v naught, and that's going to be equaling a mass of three m traveling at v one plus a mass of one m traveling at this speed that we worked out, which was uh, v two. Um, v naught. We need to figure out what v naught is. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's going to be, let's see, the M's all cancel, so we got 3 times square root of 2GL equals 3 times the number I'm looking for plus 1 times 5.45. Uh, let's see, dividing through, doing all the math, and working it out, it looks like V1 is going to come out to be 2.06 meters per second. Uh, when you get done putting in the numbers for this and that. Again, don't have my calculator handy. Sorry about that. I'm looking at the solutions and cheating, cheating, cheating. Uh, but you should be able to get this F. And then how many points is F worth? That's a very good question. Uh, F is worth three points. G is also worth three points. And G is to try to find the theta max. And so now we're going to use conservation of energy. Now that we know this, we're going to say that the kinetic energy that block number one has at the bottom turns into its potential energy. Now that's going to give me an H, and we're going to have to figure out what that means in terms of theta, but I told you a trick about this in the past. So V1 squared over 2G equals H, and H equals L times 1 minus cosine theta. So, what are we going to do here? We're going to do V1 squared over 2GL equals 1 minus cosine theta. So that means that cosine theta equals 1 minus V1 squared over 2GL. This is somebody who doesn't have his calculator uh, stalling for time here. Um, so that means that theta is going to be the inverse cosine of the quantity 1 minus V1 squared over 2GL. These things are all numbers that you know, and theta turns out to be 44 degrees. Now, please, please, God, let that be over. And it is over. All right. So I guess the only thing we didn't do is talk about how many points D. D was worth two points. E was worth two points. So that's a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 points worth of stuff. A lot of stuff going on there. It's got uh, it's got uh, a conservation of energy. It's got forces. It's got uh, it's got uh, what is this over here? Um, uh, you know, uh, two dimensional motion, projectile motion, and it's got conservation of momentum and conservation of energy with the pendulum trick in there. My God, is this thing just chock full of physicsy goodness? So there's our lesson for today. I hope you. Uh, had some questions answered. We'll see you on Monday.